Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. Arc Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by ARC. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by ARC or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by ARC to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of ARC Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Welcome to ARC's For Your Innovation podcast. Today, we have Chris Quilty founder and partner of Quilty Analytics, and senior analyst, Caleb Henry. Chris, thank you for joining today. Caleb, good to have you here. Chris, first, just to set the stage for everyone, you know, what is Quilty Analytics and uh, what led you to found the company? Uh, thanks. Uh, Quilty Analytics is a uh, relatively small boutique, about a dozen of us that do specialty research and investment banking and consulting work on the satellite and space industry. Never grew up a a space geek per se, but uh, I spent 20 years at Raymond James as a sell-side analyst, the last 10 to 15 years of which uh, was focused exclusively on the space industry. Uh, Seemed like an interesting set of developments happening and decided to jump out on my own. And it pulled together, uh, you know, a small specialized team. Uh, most of us uh, derive from from the finance side of the world, but Caleb comes actually from from the industry and publishing side. Caleb, yeah. So my background: I spent seven years as a journalist writing about the space industry, mainly for two publications, Via Satellite, and then last was Space News. Wrote about a lot of the same things that Chris covered in his financial realm, and uh, Chris is actually somebody I used to interview. <laughs> fairly regularly uh, during that past life before joining the team here. Nice. And we're now new neighbors. You know, we just moved down to St. Pete. So we've got a budding space community down here. Unfortunately, there's two breweries between your office and my office. Exactly. So it makes it easy to meet. So Chris, you, you've been in, in the industry for, for quite a while. So you've really seen the evolution here of, you know, I'd say, old space to new space what's kind of the big big shift there when when did it start and how would you characterize it or how do you frame it for yourself yeah so i would tell you the central innovation uh, it's just hard to deny the fact that has really changed the industry is launch and launch costs you know you could go back 50 60 years launch technology was unchanged the cost of launch was unchanged and the number of launches getting to orbit you know maybe went down if anything and uh, it was elon musk and spacex coming into the industry they had an entirely different you know paradigm that they were focused on needing to drive down launch costs by an order of magnitude or or two uh, which maybe they can achieve with starship we'll find out in a couple months but that drive by SpaceX to radically change launch costs has just opened up the spigot on you know, all sorts of different business models that previously you could have never justified. Now, it, it's not just launch. I mean, uh, really, if you look across the space industry, disruption is everywhere. I mean, there's not a part of the industry from you know, the satellite operators, the, the geo satellites have 500 times more capacity than they used to in 10 years. Small sats, LEO constellations, 3D printing technology. Uh, there's really no part of this industry that's safe from disruption. And, uh, you know, the good news is here, what it's really done is it shifted an industry in terms of the space industry, which was almost entirely dependent on government revenues to where we're now seeing the the shift towards commercial. 
that that's happened in every other industry you can think of. We've been on sort of a, a long delayed fuse here in the space industry because I grew up in the 1970s thinking I'd be living on a moon base by now, you know, with a robot serving me a cold glass of Tang. Uh, that didn't happen, but who knows, maybe my kids. And did either of you guys go down to the uh, Starship update or, or no? No, but Caleb tuned in, right? I paid attention. I certainly, <laughs> anytime that they're going to give an update on Starship, I'm going to follow it. And I guess, you know, right now, all of the focus for reusable is SpaceX because really they're the only one who's done it at scale. But it seems that everyone's, everyone's heading that direction. What are, what are some of the other efforts underway? Sure. So uh, it might be worth pointing out just at the beginning, if you ask any launch company, including the ones that preceded SpaceX, they're all going to tell you that they studied reusability. Um, and of course, the space shuttle was a reusable vehicle, essential, more or less. Uh, yeah, quote unquote reusable. But the, the point there is just that the idea of reusability is not new. It's the successful execution of reusability that is new. And so SpaceX has done that. They proved from a technological standpoint that it could work. And that was not a given when they were in their early days. And they are hopefully proving financially that it works. I say hopefully because they don't disclose their financial metrics as a private company. Um, But they have had enormous success in capturing a large share of the launch market that was previously dominated by Russia and Europe. Uh, And now a commanding portion of that is in the U.S. because of their success. Outside of SpaceX, I would say the discussion for reusability has been reinvigorated uh, because of their success. And so it's really not even a question of who is doing it as much as who isn't (laughs) at this point. Nearly every major launch provider has a path to reusability at this point. Whether or not they go forward with it is still to be determined, but the European Space Agency and their prime contractor, Ariane Group, have been working on a reusable engine called Prometheus. You've got Vulcan with United Launch Alliance that potentially has a reusable first stage. Blue Origin is pursuing reusability with their rocket. Rocket Lab with Neutron, Relativity Space with their vehicles. And yeah, the list goes on. Um, it's it's a very long list, and uh, you know the difference now again is that you can you can ask people what are you doing with reusability, and they won't just show you their latest study. Um, they'll show you hardware. It's definitely a, a big step when you go from PowerPoint presentation to to physical item. And then next step is physical item in the field. Blow some things up, and then we're then we're getting places. And then Chris, you were talking about you know the bandwidth not just in low earth orbit uh but also the geosynchronous layer right now all of the focus is i won't say all you know we get announcements every day pretty much of new constellations being thought about a lot of them are in low earth orbit but that's not necessarily where all of the action is happening as you mentioned what's the right way do you think to think about the different orbits yeah, so I think the the term that's really taken hold here in in recent years is a hybrid architecture. Certainly the Department of Defense and a lot of the commercial providers are now looking at the fact that there are benefits. I mean, neither one is a perfect solution. Leos don't solve all your problems, geos don't. But if you can combine some element of Leo, Mio, Geo, Heo. Yeah, there is a high Earth orbit one. Uh, Mangata is doing that. There are benefits in terms of having coverage, capacity, you know, the ability to distribute amongst uh, various satellites. And, uh, you know, you see a number of companies that have really moved forward with that strategy. SES, probably the most notable company that acquired O3B about a decade ago, and they're building upon that with a a Geo-Mio architecture. You know, there's other companies like uh, Viasat, which was, you know, long a a defender of Geo um, with their recent acquisition or announced acquisition of Inmarsat, is previously talked about possibly building a Mio or Leo system. So kind of like reusability, 
when the first back in 2015, when SpaceX and OneWeb first announced that they were going to build these constellations, everybody, including yours truly, was like, nah, not going to happen. You know, we've seen this before in the 1990s. They all went bankrupt. I wrote a piece at Raymond James. I've, I've since burned. Um, but, you know, now, now uh, I mean, our conclusion is here internally, there will be at least five of these constellations that will come to market. And that was before last week, Greg Weiler announced his third attempt at a LEO broadband, a new company called eSpace, which we don't know much about, which got a, a nice $50 million seed funding round. So what I would say is if you're in the satellite manufacturing business, you know, there's an upside of building tons of little LEO satellites, but the geo business, the, the folks that build those satellites have really fallen on hard times. I mean, as recently as 2014, you were seeing satellite orders in, you know, 20 a year plus. And I think for the last four or five years, there's been about seven satellites ordered. Now, it's not to say 2022 is going to be kind of a big year for geos. You've got both Viasat and Hughes with some of the biggest monster, very high throughput satellites coming on orbit, and they're going to have their day in the sun to show how well that technology works. But you know, I think that the challenge that those systems also present is they've gone over budget and they've taken years beyond when they were supposed to be on orbit. And when you're positioned against LEO satellites where you, know, you can launch a next generation technology every several months, you know, the idea of building a satellite that takes you five years to build and is gonna spend 15 years on orbit, you're talking generational changes that are going to happen in front of you. And so you have to be really certain about that technology if you're going to lay out $2.3 billion of investment, which is what uh, Viasat has characterized that Viasat 3 constellation investment as. Wow. I got a few questions follow up. So five constellations. I want to ask how, how we come to five. And then also, I, maybe first we just tackle... You know, that's kind of been the history of space companies failing is, you know, over budget and delayed. And is a lot of that due to the outsourcing? I know that, you know, you look at the original Iridium failure and again, that those came in way over budget and the contractors couldn't couldn't come in at the right costs. Is the future verticalization through the industry or how do you think about the dynamics there? Yeah. So on your question on delays, um, I, I remember there was a quote by Elon Musk when they they launched the very first successful Falcon 9. And I was there because I got to drive across state and watch it. And somebody asked him, they said, hey, you know, you're whatever, two years or three years behind when you said you would launch this rocket. And he turned to the reporter and he said, well, in this industry, it means I'm on time. Um, that's not a very, you know, reassuring quote, but, you know, unfortunately it's true. Now, specific to the programs that I, I just mentioned with Viasat and, um, you know, Hughes, their, their primary competitor, both of them did get a little bit of a handicap from COVID, right? You know, factory shutdowns, component issues, specific to Viasat. I mean, this is arguably, uh, and Hughes, these are the most complex satellites ever built, you know, first of a kind, bespoke design and production. And add to it, Viasat is building the payloads themselves and they've never built a, a satellite payload before. So there's a lot of stuff that goes into it and presumably the Viasat 4s and 5s that would follow, they'll move a lot quicker on. But in terms of, you know, I think your question about the, the vertical verticalization of the industry, there's a couple of things. There's We're seeing vertical integration happening from a distribution perspective. Satellite operators, which traditionally were very wholesale and they would just sell capacity to third parties that would provision a service. We've seen Intelsat forward integrate into the in-flight connectivity market with the acquisition of GoGo. SES is kind of going direct in the cruise market, um, even if it's not publicly stated. Uh, Viasat did a forward integration to buy RigNet. So the distribution channels in this industry are getting a little bit scrambled. And to your point, you're also seeing uh, what used to be very clean silos. You know, you had companies that built satellites, 
companies that launched satellites, companies that operated satellites, and companies that did ground equipment, and they never crossed paths. Well, now you've got SpaceX, which is building satellites, launching satellites, and operating satellites, right? Kind of shakes up the Apple card. Likewise, you know, Viasat, as previously mentioned, they're building satellites and they're provisioning service and going vertical to the end customer. Inmarsat was doing a bit of the same. They were a traditional wholesale distributor and at least in the in-flight connectivity market, they're going direct. So back to my original statement, disruption is everywhere. Disruption is everywhere. And then circling back, why five constellations? Or yeah, how, how are you thinking about these five constellations that seem most feasible? Is this a geographic type of breakdown or, or is something else going on there? Caleb, you want to run through the count? Yeah, there's definitely a geographic element here. I think it's interesting that had this question been posed three or four years ago, as it often was at industry conferences, people usually said two, maybe three. And now I think we're along with the industry consensus for maybe five. And the number, to my surprise, keeps going up in terms of constellations that are announced. But like you said, or like you hinted at, there are, there are regional dynamics at play here. So you have constellations that are going forward in the US. You have SpaceX and Amazon here. In Canada, you have Telesat. In Europe, you have OneWeb. And uh, in China, you have, uh, I, forgive me, I can't actually pronounce, or, or I'm too scared to try on a podcast to announce the name of the Chinese constellation. <laughs> But uh, you have a constellation there. And even more recently, uh, the idea put forward by the European Commission of a, a European constellation. And you know, I, can, I can keep listing them. But the point is, uh, if you're looking at you know, big satellite broadband communications constellations, you know, you've got SpaceX, Amazon, Telesat, OneWeb, and China. And you have interests from, you'd say, North America in having uh, satellite communications from LEO. Europe has a vested interest in this, and China has a vested interest in it. So expect to see those go forward, not least because uh, there's, or I shouldn't say we expect all five to go forward, but because of the regional dynamics, governments are supporting on each of those continents one or more constellations, and that boosts their viability. Yeah, and I'd say, you know, the other thing, you know, there's a bit of a backstory here. It's like, why, right? You know, somebody comes up with a good idea and everybody wants to copy it, but there's very unique motivations behind all of these players. And, and it's worth noting, as I mentioned, back in 2014, 2015, actually, Elon Musk raced ahead, uh, a week ahead of Greg Weiler to beat him in the announcement, which was kind of interesting. But, you know, why SpaceX? And I think they've said pretty publicly, the reason that they're building Starlink is they need more revenues if they're going to build a colony on Mars. I mean, the global launch industry is a $5 billion a year industry. So even if you took 100% of it at very high margin, you're not going to generate enough cash to build a Mars colony. Telecom is a trillion dollar industry. So if you can you know, generate a $20, $30 billion business out of providing connectivity, you know, that there's your, your Mars colony. OneWeb, which was, again, uh, a Greg Weiler invention, he's pretty consistently been focused altruistically on providing connectivity to the unconnected, going back to the days when he was laying fiber in Rwanda. And that was the original emphasis behind OneWeb. And he, he did it in a smart way by bringing in a bunch of strategic partners from you know, Coca-Cola to Bahardi and others that you know, could buy into that theory. Amazon? has been much more tight-lipped around why they're doing it, other than you know, it was kind of a high-profile uh, Bezos versus Musk kind of backstory that happens. But if you look at it from an Amazon perspective, you know, there's lots of reasons why this makes sense. Publicly, they kind of state it's kind of like the, the one web, we want to connect the unconnected. And, you know, whatever, if you sign up more people to internet service and more people sign up for Amazon Prime, maybe there's a business model there. But you know, you also look at the global telecom infrastructure that Amazon needs to support for their business, which has dozens of telecom providers and inconsistent service. If you could build your own telecom infrastructure 
with very low latency edge computing capabilities, I mean, that's reason enough to go ahead and vertically integrate your own telecom infrastructure. You know, if we go to Telesat, uh, they were more of a regional SATCOM service provider, one of the big four players in the market. They etched out a pretty interesting spectrum position that's actually in front of Amazon in terms of priority rights. And, uh, you know, as a company that had a bit of a regional play, they clearly saw, you know, a challenge around not having a global solution. And, uh, you know, Canada is a company, a country that has, you know, much more challenging low density issues where uh, a Leo sort of makes sense for them. The EU and or the European Commission, partly they felt like they, they missed the boat in the launch market and they felt like they're missing the boat in the Leo broadband market, even though, you know, the major European satellite operators, including SES, which has their Empower constellation, Utilsat, which invested in OneWeb, you know, they've all got a little bit of a Leo broadband play, but the satellite manufacturers, the Airbus and Talisalania space in Europe don't necessarily. Uh, so they do. Uh, Airbus is building satellites for OneWeb and Talis has gotten a, a preliminary contract with Telesat. But, you know, Europe wants to get involved. And, uh, you know, China, likewise, doesn't want to be left out in the cold. And they have reasons why, whether it's uh, Geely, the, I hope I said that right, the, the car manufacturer, you know, looks at this for a way for tracking and communicating with vehicles. China probably looks at this as another belt and road way to tie in other countries into the, the China ecosystem. So we're going to see lots of satellites going on orbit from all sorts of different directions. That was a terrific summation and terrific background as well. If we're talking space, we can't ignore the SPAC boom of 2021 and the amount of money that, that came into the space. And you know, you know, when we look at it, it's both good and bad. Um, it's definitely good because it's a way to raise money that a lot of these companies wouldn't have had access to either. Space businesses are not the typical venture capital darling, right? They're, they're hardware, they're hard, they're lower margin. And so it's a great way to get capital to big ideas. But at the same time, anytime there's, there's a rush, you get a wide range, I would say, in quality of project and degree to which it's a real project or just a presentation. But from your perspective, you know, you, you're probably saw all sides of it being on the investment banking side and the research side. So, you know, what, what was the year like for you? Uh, well, first, some context. Before we talk about SPACs, let's talk about venture capital. Years ago, I used to have a marketing deck and when I'd go out to talk to investors, <laughs> unfortunately, as the space analyst, I had a slide on why people don't invest in space. And, and it listed all the obvious things, like it's capital intensive, it takes a long time, there's massive government exposure, things go boom. You know, these are not the characteristics that ever attracted venture investment. However, lo and behold, the year 2015, the same year that Elon Musk and Greg Weiler announced their efforts, you had this sudden spike in venture capital investing in the space industry. So to put it in context, you had maybe globally, less than a dozen space companies a year that receive venture funding, going back decades, right? Nowadays, we are seeing dozens of companies getting funded. And the amount of capital invested, uh, I ran the numbers, the 10 years prior to 2015, it was $140 million a year globally <laughs> in venture investing in space. Since then, and I haven't totaled up this year's numbers, but up and before this year, it was running north of, it was like a billion and a half a year in dozens of companies. So what happened? Why did space suddenly become cool for venture? And I think there's a lot of reasons. I mean, it is the transition from government to commercial. It's from these big geos to small sats. It's the fact that you get all these data-centric business models. I mean, people don't invest in satellite imagery companies because they like building imaging satellites. They like the data that comes off it. And that was really a lot of the pitch is space assets capture and move tremendous amounts of data and communication. And that is attractive. Unfortunately, you got to put some capital in 
to get it. Now, here's the concern. If the this venture capital boom started in 2015 and most VC funds have like a 10-year investment horizon, here we are in 2021, 22, it's like time for exits, right? And as of a couple of years ago, right prior to, to COVID, I was holding up the warning flag saying, hey, this industry is a roach motel because nobody's made it out of here. There's not a lot of M&A, nobody's going public, and you know nobody's going to put money in again if we don't get exits. I thought that COVID was going to cause things to crash and burn, and instead, everything has accelerated. Venture funding, public companies, and the SPAC boom. And to your point, what we've seen is a dozen, 13 companies have come public in, in the past year plus in the space industry. That's pretty unprecedented. I mean, you'd get maybe a company a year in the space industry that would come public in normal times. It's not to say that it's unprecedented. I will make my admission here. Back in my Raymond James days, we executed the very first ever space SPAC, which most people forget was Iridium. Actually came public in a SPAC 1.0 transaction. It's a long history of that. But I think what's also interesting about SPACs and space is I think arguably the entire SPAC phenomenon was kicked off by a space deal which was the Virgin Galactic deal back in 2019. That really started, you know, certainly for the space industry, but I think for the broader markets, was one of the, the sort of marquee deals that, that sort of opened up the spigot on SPACs. And I'd agree with you. I mean, the outcome here has not been good in the early part of 2022 with most SPACs. But I mean, for that matter, the markets itself are down and these are more volatile higher beta investment vehicles. So it makes sense they're going to be down more. So it'll be important to see, you know, within the next, you know, six, 12 months as these companies develop out their business models and hopefully the market stabilize and trend back up that they do, you know, recapture, uh, you know, some of the lost ground that they've, they've made. But look, I mean, as somebody that, you know, deals in an industry that has forever been capital starved, I can't say I'm disappointed by the fact that you know there's a dozen or so companies that have have sucked up you know billions of dollars of investment capital that's sitting on their balance sheets and are going to help a number of companies you know to move forward and and create new business models. And then as as we wrap up here, Caleb, what's exciting you the most about space? You know, that's always a really hard question. Uh, I feel like I get it a lot and. It's difficult to point at one thing. So my cheap answer to this is everything. <laughs> uh, and the reason that I say that uh, goes back to actually what, what Chris was saying, that things are, are changing so much more rapidly now. You know, when I started writing on the industry in 2013, 2014, I had a lot of people telling me, that the space industry also, it's, I think it's getting a little younger, but it's generally uh, a more mature industry, we'll call it. So uh, people who had been in the industry for 20, 30, 40 years were telling me that they had seen more change in the past two to three than they had in their entire careers prior to that, which was pretty exciting for me as somebody who's just getting into it. And I think that that's rung true, not just for launch, uh, you know, the brightest spectacle is going to be SpaceX landing rockets, but there's not a part of the industry that you can look at where this kind of revolution isn't happening. Uh, you know, SpaceX was founded in 2002. 2003, the first CubeSat launched, and we've all seen what that did. And now you look at uh, all of the, the big cloud companies that are getting into space, and every it seems like it's every six months, maybe less, where a big you know, Fortune 500 or, or large company is getting into space. And that's not something that the industry has seen for a while. So this really heightened level of interest, it's everywhere. It's in rockets, it's in spacecraft manufacturing, it's in the ground segment with the antennas and cloud and everything else. There's really no part where uh, things aren't looking radically different than they did in the past and where there's a lot of optimism for it to be even more promising in the future. Nice. And then Chris, to you, what's your favorite non-consensus view currently? Oh, 
you know, I would say that the sort of crazy stuff I grew up thinking about as a kid in the 1970s, watching Space 1999 and Battlestar Galactica and whatnot. I'm not arguing for a warfare or the moon breaking away, but what I am saying is, you know, there's a lot of stuff that is starting to move out into cislunar space. So every business model that exists today in the space industry is around moving data from space down to the earth. But there's no commerce that actually happens in space. Nothing is built in space and brought down. There's no financial transactions happening in space or activities that are creating value. And I think with the launch cost down, I mean, Caleb and I could run through a list of companies that are building depots in space, manufacturing in space, plans on making Z-Bland fiber and bringing it down, building stuff on the moon, uh, go through the whole list of stuff. And, and it's not only commercial activity, but uh, the Department of Defense, you know, this year in their state of the space industrial base went out and laid out a whole big case around activities that, that they want to support in the commercial sector to enhance and enable you know, commerce in, in cislunar, which for those of you that are not familiar, it's kind of like from the earth all the way out to the moon on the dark side. And uh, I think some of that stuff, I mean, certainly in our lifetime, in the next five to 10 years will become much more tangible, which will give me a path to getting my timeshare on the moon where I can get a robot to serve me a cold glass of tank. That's the end game. I don't know if my wife will awesome. let me go, but sounds cool. <laughs> Well, Chris and Caleb, thank you so much for joining. I think we're going to have to do a, a group field trip to see a launch or something since we're all down here. You bet. ARC believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that ARC believes to be reliable. However, ARC does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from ARC. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.